Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sri Zaheer, Dean of the Carlson School of Management, and I'd like to welcome you once more to First Tuesday, which, as you know, is one of the longest-running business meetings in the Twin Cities, so thank you for being here. And today, we are joined by Dan Flornis. He will share his experience leading Fastenal, a Fortune 500 company, and then we will sit together for a brief fireside chat before we open it up to questions. But before we get to Dan, I want to recognize First Tuesday's long-standing corporate and media partners, Wells Fargo and Twin Cities Business. Let's have a round of applause for them. You help keeping it going as the longest business community gathering in the cities. And of course, a very special thank you to the many, many Carlson School of Management and University of Minnesota supporters in our audience who are here today. And that includes several luminaries, you know, folks like Mark Ritchie, who's the former Secretary of State. Mark, where are you? There you are. <laughs> and let's hope we get Expo 2027 here, right? And as well as UM, uh, University of uh, Minnesota Foundation CEO, Kathy Schmidlkoffer, several University of Minnesota Foundation trustees, and leaders from the University of Minnesota Duluth, which, uh, which has had a long-standing relationship with Fastenal. And the folks... <laughs> so among the leaders from UMD who are here today, there's Amy Heitapelto, who's the Executive Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs and an alumna of the Carlson PhD program. Amy, where are you? There, okay, there you are. And Praveen Agarwal, who is the Interim Dean of UMD's Lebovitz School of Business. Praveen, just make sure there you are. Welcome to all of you. And I'm very excited to introduce today's featured speaker, Dan Flornis. Jan is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Fastenal, one of the largest distributors of industrial and construction products in the country. Among many initiatives at Fastenal, based in Winona, Minnesota, he has helped lead the development of the company's on-site service model. We hope to hear a little more about that. These are small on-site vending uh, and sales, uh, sort of, it's almost like a small retail outlet located within manufacturing plants. And it's re in recent years, it's emerged as a pivotal growth driver and a market differentiator. In 2019, he was recognized as one, uh, one of America's most innovative leaders by Forbes. Dan joined Fastenal in 96 as the company's chief financial officer, where he fostered its reputation for exemplary finance operations, and in that role, he was recognized as one of the te nation's 10 best CFOs by the Wall Street Journal, and as CFO of the year by the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal. And so, and prior to joining Fastenal, Dan spent 10 years with KPMG LLP, and uh, much of it in the Twin Cities. So outside of Fastenal, Dan serves with me as a director on the board of HP Fuller, and is a member of the Bellin Gunderson Health System Board of Trustees. Dan grew up on a farm in Wisconsin and resides in the Winona area with his wife, Jenny, who is here with us today as well, and four children. So please join me in welcoming my friend, Dan Flornis. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for the warm reception. As, and thank you, Sri, for the gracious introduction. As, uh, as uh, Sri mentioned, I'm with an organization called Fastenal Company. We're about a, a $7 billion uh, distributor of industrial supplies. We started in uh, Winona, Minnesota, and if you take a look at the, the first slide that uh, I think they're gonna pop up, maybe the second slide. I have the clicker. Thank you for reminding me of that. So uh, 
Fastenal was started by Bob Carlin back in 1967. And for a little background on Bob, Bob grew up in the Winona community. He, uh, his father worked in the parts department at a local automobile dealership. And as a kid, uh, Bob saw his dad go out and start a business, BK Auto Supply, down in Winona. And Bob would, uh, would uh, sweep the floors for a few nickels and uh, would man the counter when his dad was out making deliveries. And Bob learned at a young age, you know, a lot of people come in asking for fasteners. Huh. And then he went off to college. He, he's a mechanical engineer by training. And while he's at college, he had this idea that was going through his head. What if we started a business that sold fasteners? And a lot of automotive fasteners came in a, a package about the size of a cigarette package. And vending was very common for cigarettes back in the day. And he thought, if you can vend cigarettes, we could vend fasteners. So picture a laundromat. But instead of going into a laundromat and seeing a bunch of uh, washing machines, you'd come in and the walls would be lined with vending machines. And you'd go put in your four quarters, push in a slot, pull it out, presto, 24 by 7. You could get fasteners for any project you could work on. So Bob convinced a few high school friends to, to pool some resources together and to start this business in the late 60s. And one of the friends didn't have money, but he had time and he had a used car, and that was our first delivery vehicle. So, so Van McConnell was our first salesperson. He'd go out and call on businesses. And they discovered something. A lot of stuff that people wanted to buy did not fit in Bob's machine. So three months into our existence, we went with plan B. Vending was thrown out the window, and we went with plan B. And that was, let's just call on business to see how we can help them out. And we did that for many years. And uh, eventually, and I'll t we'll touch on that a little bit later in the discussion, we, we went back to the vending idea. but. As Shree mentioned, I started with Fastenal as Chief Financial Officer, and, and one of the way I take the edge off, off my, uh, my anxiety at the moment when I'm speaking to a room is, I'll throw a slide up with some numbers on it, and then you feel a little more comfortable. <laughs> so this is a view of Fastenal, and this is a slide I used a few weeks ago at our annual meeting. And on that, you can see there's a column for 2012, there's a 2017, 2022. So I've, I've been in the role a number of years, and I thought, Let's take a look at what's happened in the last five and 10 years. But of equal importance, the message that's gone to both our shareholders and to our employees is, what might the future look like for Fastenal? And the best way to show the future is give a taste of the past. So if you, you look at the 2000, uh, we have a $10 billion number and a $15 billion number. And I was CFO long enough to know you don't put a date on that, because you just get yourself in trouble in a conversation. But you can talk concept. So if you look at our business and you start looking at uh, what our business has done over time, I'm pleased to say that we've gone through some transitions as an organization. And, and we've, we've grown well. In fact, if I go back to uh, Fastenal in 1987, the year we went public, we were a $20 million distributor with 50 locations in about uh, 20 states, around mostly the Midwestern United States, and about 350 employees. But again, we had this idea of what we could be. And over time, we've grown. And uh, today, we are months away from doing not 20 million or 25 million, but $30 million in revenue every day, not in the year. And, uh, and, and I'm pleased to say that as we've morphed the model, we've accelerated our ability to grow. So you can see from 2012 to 2017, we're growing about uh, 17 or about 7%. In the last five years, we grew just south of 10. Or, and uh, a little story, my, my wife is my best friend and she's my critic. And at the annual meeting when I was sharing this slide, I said it would have been much funner if we would have uh, had this show 10% instead of 9.7. Thank God I didn't say more funner. Of course, she'd have really gotten on my case, but, uh, but, a, but a great opportunity to see the business expand. The other piece that I started looking at is, in that same time, Fastenal is a very decentralized business. And there was a lot of chaos going on in the last five years, at least that's what I've heard. 
maybe a little bit of stuff going on with tariffs, and when you sell industrial supplies, tariffs are a really big deal in your business. Maybe a little bit going on with COVID, and you're interacting with thousands of customers every day. That's an important part of the business. I'm pleased to say the, the team at Fastenal not only found success in our ability to grow, but we found success in our ability to be more efficient as we were adopting more and more technology in our business. And we grew our earnings faster in the last five years than we did in the, in the previous five years. But not all things are, are perfect. We did have to add resources to the business, especially in 2021 and 22, as supply chains were freezing up around the world. Um, they were impacting us as well. And one thing I asked of our team is, we have a covenant with our customer. So we're, su we're supplying the things in a, in a business's operation. It might be fasteners that's going into what they're producing, our OEM faster business. It might be fasteners or other supplies that's going into operating the facility. In fact, if you walked around the U of M campus and you walked around with the facility's maintenance people, you would discover there's about 30 vending machines on this campus that are dispensing supplies that the facility maintenance people use throughout. You'd also find out there's between 15 and 20 what we call FMI stocks, so fastener um, supply that we put out close to the point of use to allow the folks here to be more efficient in what they do in maintaining this great facility or this great campus. And that's what we do. But our covenant is when you need something, we won't let you down. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced in the econ world, sometimes you go to order something, it's not available. Sometimes you want to take a, an Uber or a Lyft and you can't get a car. I've had that happen to me a few times leaving a sporting event, you can't get a vehicle. Our covenant with our customer is you need something, we will have it for you. And it caused us to dramatically increase our working capital. Uh, after all, a, a distribution business, that's, all, that's really what we are, is, a, is inventory and some accounts receivable. We dramatically increased that, but we still have a vision of what we think we look like when we're 10 billion and 15 billion. Part of putting it in a slide like this is we're making a statement to our shareholders, we're gonna get back here. And, and it reminds our own employees that this is, we can be a great supply chain business and still manage it fiscally very efficiently. And then finally, if you look at that last line, it's, and you might notice looking at this, we're a relatively profitable business. And what matters about being a relatively profitable business, it means when we make a promise to a customer, we can honor that, prom that promise. When we say we will have inventory to support your needs, we can react to that and have the inventory available. And we can invest in the infrastructure of the business to be a great business partner. We've invested about 800 million in the last uh, 10 or so years just in that in little industrial vending business that was Bob's idea back in 1967. Another one is looking at our business and saying, how is it being transformed by all this technology? Hey, technology is great, but are you solving a problem or are you just creating one? And here is a, is a view of our business looking at what we think our business morphs to over time. We call it our digital footprint. And what you can see as we move from left to right on this slide is that we see more and more of our product going through technology that's embedded into our customer's facility. And even though we historically were more of a, a storefront in our approach, we've grown our e-commerce business quite dramatically. And COVID provided an accelerating factor for that. Fortunately for us, we had the infrastructure in place to step up and help our customers, and it helped evolve our business model at the same time. So seven years ago, I stepped into the role of CEO of Fastenal, and to be honest with you, I didn't, I didn't know what that entailed. I still remember the conversation. I came home from work one day, and, and my wife said to me, hey, um, we were talking about some stuff with the kids, and I said, hey, guess what I found out an hour ago? She said, what? I said, I found out I'm, the, I'm Fastenal's next president and CEO. And I said, it was a really weird conversation with the board. Because the bubble was kind of hanging out there saying, hey, Dan, we'd like you to be our next president and CEO. And the next bubble that popped out was, we think you should consider having a coach. And Fastenal isn't a firm, to, isn't an organization that generally goes out and seeks help like that. 
And I wasn't sure what they were telling me, and I, I, I thought I'd get a comment from my wife thinking how ridiculous that was. And she looked at me and said, are you going to do it? I said, really? Am I, am I at the right house? And so I worked with the coach for about six months. I have to say, I learned a ton in that process. Learned a lot about me. I learned about a, a lot about being a leader. I learned a lot about what people needed me to be in the role. And after the experience, I went to Peter Gittinger, who leads our internal corporate university, Fastenal School of Business. And I said, I said to Peter, I said, you know, we have great leaders at Fastenal. How do we tap into that population and bring a coaching experience? Because we can't bring a coaching experience like what I had to 500 people. But I would love to bring it to our senior leaders throughout the organization in a way that's meaningful for them. And in, in true, Pete's more of an academic, which means he approaches it differently than I would. I'd just jump into it. He was very thoughtful about the approach. He, he, he involved input from a lot of our leaders. And we came up with 24 key attributes of leadership that we thought were special, that our leaders felt was special for them. And it really is boiled down into five categories. The first one, as a leader, what are you doing every day to develop yourself? What are the habits you have so you are a, a strong and capable leader to serve the needs of those you lead? The secondly, second item was, what are you doing to develop others every day? Because that's the obligation of a leader is, is, are you investing in everybody else around you? And the last three, we referred to as DAC. What is the direction of the organization, the alignment of resources, and the commitment to that? This is a, a course that we've provided to our leaders ever since 2019, because we think it's critical to the success of our organization, because we're very decentralized, and that's important for our employees. Speaking of employees, this is something we share internally and externally as well. This is looking at our demographics. Um, it wasn't too many years ago, organizations typically didn't talk about this kind of stuff. I think it was in 2016, uh, I'd, I'd been in the role for a year, and we had an employee event. And I threw this slide up on the board for our, our leaders to see at, a, at an employee expo with about 2,000 employees. And I said, you know, we started in Winona, Minnesota. Most people in Winona, Minnesota look a lot like me. But then we moved beyond Winona, Minnesota. And we went to other places across the United States. Today we operate in 25 countries. We found a lot of people that don't look like me. We learned that, you know what, they might have different customs, might have uh, uh, d different ways of, of speaking. There's no monopoly on talent in life. Embrace those folks around you. And I'm pleased to say as we've moved beyond Winona and as we've moved out of the rural areas and into the metro areas, today communities like Minneapolis-St. Paul represent about 52% of our revenue, and communities like Winona represent the other 48 as we've moved, we've found great people wherever we've gone. And over time, as we've moved, our demographics have changed. The only thing on this slide that I see that I find personally frustrating is the middle column on, on the female side of the population. I remember in 2019, we had a, 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 our last Fastenal employee event before COVID hit. And we had 60 employees on stage that we were honoring for 25 years of service. I remember thinking about looking at that group up on stage, and I knew most, I, not all of them, but most of them. They looked a lot like me. There were six females. So in Fastenal in 1994, 10% of our population, if, if 25 years later this is representative of our population, 10% were female. I'm pleased to say that over time, we created an environment. While I don't know that we'll, 50.3% of the working age population is female. I don't know if we'll have 50.3% of our population being female at some point, but I think we'll keep moving towards it because we're looking for great people and we're looking for talent to serve our customers. And the frustrating item I see there is COVID did a number on females in our society and I hope society has a way of figuring that out. When you shut down schools, you shut down daycares, that fell disproportionately on one segment of population. You can see it in our numbers. We've been stuck at 24. We should be at 28% female right now. We haven't gotten there, but we will. And then we'll hit 30, and then we'll go beyond that. <laughs> Finally, uh, I'm on a college campus. 
I can't be at a college campus, even though this, it's not full of a room full of college students. I suspect all of us were a college student at one point. But I can't come to a college campus and not share this. And this is something I, I, I was speaking to our, our regional recruiters last fall. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to give them a gift. If I were back in college, what would impact me on why FASTO might be a great place to work? And so this is a, a list of 10 things. I think, the, I think a few of them stand out. We believe in people at Fastenal. We're very decentralized, and we will challenge you to make decisions early in your career, and that's going to scare the heck out of a lot of kids. And they will learn, and they'll gain confidence in the process. We build for the future every day. I talked about geographically where we operate already, so I won't touch on those. And we believe in investing in lifelong education. That's how you have a great organization, and customers recognize that, and they want to be partnered with us, not because of fast on our in our supply chain capabilities, but because of fast on our supply chain capabilities, we make it easier for our local folks to just be great and develop their skills every day and to serve customers at a high level. I believe the U of M is one of those that benefits from that culture. Um, the uh, the uh, rest is a little bit about, uh, we learned a lot about ourselves during COVID. We learned how adaptive human beings can be and you know, we figured out a way as a society to get through it. Some days were louder than others, but we figured it out. And uh, that's all I have for you today. shri has got a few questions that she's going to ask me. I told her if she wants to put me on the spot, go right ahead. Makes it more fun. More fun. And, uh, and then I hope, hope there's some questions from the audience afterwards. And again, any, any questions, fair game. Thank you. Well done. That has been very, very, very interesting. And I'm, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, I mean, Bob Gurlin built a great company, and you have taken it further. And it's just amazing what you've also accomplished in the time that you've, since you've turned, taken over as CEO. Now, growing up as a young boy in near Lake Pepin, Wisconsin, did you think you were going to be CEO of a major, you know, Fortune 500 company? And uh, so how, tell us a little bit about your journey. So uh, uh, that couldn't have been further from what I thought would happen in life, in all honesty. I, I, uh, I attended University of Wisconsin, River Falls, about 45 minutes from here. I, I went there because it was a, it was a, it was a spot my, uh, my parents could, could help me afford. It was a really good agricultural school. And I went there for agriculture. And I figured I'd have a career in agriculture. Fortunately, I had an agri uh, a professor in my sophomore year that talked me into an internship. Okay. And that internship um, resulted in, in me learning a bit about me. And one was I enjoyed the business side more than the agricultural side. And I added a bunch of, my, my major was egg business, so I was taking a lot of business courses already. I doubled down on that. And it put me in a position some years later, I met an individual who was on campus recruiting the only reason I talked to him, I was, tired, I was kind of tired of the day, bored of the day. And I, and I had talked to this person because he had played hockey at River Falls, and I knew of his name. By the end of the discussion, he offered me the opportunity to interview for an internship, and I spent 10 years at KPMG as a result of that discussion. And oh, by the way, I had to add accounting as a second major be before I accepted the internship in order to get credit for the internship. And then I graduated with a major in accounting. And, and I would not have pictured me in this role today. In this role with that. Well, amazing. Great, great stories. And, and uh, you know, I'm also very curious. I know you talk about having a, a, a Fastenal business school, so you're competing with us right now. I mean, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'm also very uh, curious to know. I mean, it, you know, we, for instance, we do a lot of work in the supply chain area at the Carlson School as well. So how can we help you? And what does the Fastenal Business University do? The, uh, so the, we hire folks uh, typically early in their career. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we try to do, if, if you visited, if you randomly went to 100 fast known locations and you kind of paid attention and you asked everybody what they were doing, you'd find out that about 30% of our local employees are actually part-time, but we don't hire part-time employees. We go to four-year um, state schools, typically, state colleges, two-year technical colleges, and we ask people to join us, and we're looking for future, 
full-time employees. We're not looking for part-time employees. But, um, um, but we say, you know, come work for us 15, 20 hours a week. Let's date before we get married. And you can learn a little bit about us. You might decide that our culture of empowerment and, and challenging you to make decisions is not for you. You might find, I love it, and I want to be part of that. And, uh, and so a year, two years later when you graduate, you join us. So when you hire folks with that background, they aren't specialists on day one in the mechanical attributes of a, of a faster. So early on, we teach a lot of product knowledge to our employees, but it quickly switches from product knowledge to leadership skills and business skills. They're running a, they're running a business. If I'm um, running a business uh, doing $160,000 a month in Duluth, Minnesota, I'm running a $2 million distribution business. And I need to go out and recruit talent. Having a great relationship with UMD is one way that you recruit great talent. I need to go out and learn how to have a market plan. How am I going to grow the business over time? And then I need to know how I can generate enough cash flow that I can afford to honor the promises I make to my customers. And that's what we teach in our school of business. That's fabulous. That's great. I mean, I love this investment in the people. I mean, it just, uh, just again, shows the kind of the value of business as a force for good, which is something that we believe very deeply at the Carlson School as well, which is which is terrific. I was curious, I mean, you talked a little bit about your strategy as well going forward. I mean, it looks like a lot of your growth is going to come from the on-site business and from the, and from the sort of digital kind of uh, footprint. So are you pulling back from some of your retail operations? What's, you know, what's your strategic vision in that whole space? You know, when I stepped into the, ro the role, I remember the coach saying something, you gotta figure out what this role is. Right. What, what, what is Dan in this role? Okay. And, and, and it quickly dawned on me, uh, given my background, uh, you learn how to observe. And you, you find pockets of success. Because there's a lot of incubation of activities going on in the decentralized organization. And then you become a cheerleader. And you go out and tell folks about success we're finding in this branch in New Mexico, this branch in Virginia, this branch in Mexico, this branch up in Canada. You're telling people about it. And one of the things that jumped out at me, so we had been in the upper Midwest for a long time. And, and you, sometimes you get to the point with just that same storefront, you, you, you run into a challenge and the numbers get more difficult to grow. And uh, we had a, a few uh, innovative district managers that had a customer that said, hey, uh, we couldn't, I remember the first one, we couldn't find a building in town. And the customer said, hey, I have a building on my, on my site. Why don't you use our building? And all of a sudden, we lowered our occupancy cost. Well, part of our gross margin model, you need to cover the expenses of your business, or you're not in business very long. Well, it's, it's kind of like kids getting out of college. If they want to save some money, they can move in with their parents. Our kids don't have that option, by the way. <laughs> but they can. If we want to save some money, we might move in with our customer. And then the universe of what we can sell changes because our cost structure is lower and we can bring more value. We had seen success with it in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and we'd seen a lot of success with it in our business in Mexico. And I just tell, I started telling everybody about it, and then I, I challenged our IT folks. We have a point of sale system that was designed for a, for a, a storefront, a retail business. Right. We need to modify our, our technology to support this kind of business. So seven, eight years ago, um, the on-site subset of our business was about 10% of revenue. Right. Today, it's, low, it's, it's between 40 and 50. And it's because our local leaders had better tools, but they also could engage with their customer in a different way. And we, we still love our branch-based business, and we continue to grow our branch-based business. But sometimes the best way to grow the branch-based business is to ask that customer that you're doing 30 or $40,000 a month with, hey, can we move in? Mm -hmm. We think we could provide more value to you, and that gives us a whole new leg of growth in the, in the local market. Right. No, that's, that's an amazing strategy, and, and, to, and, and also just how much it eases your uh, customer's ability. So, so, I mean, it sort of smooths the supply chain for them. You're holding the inventory in their space. Uh, you know, just a very, very interesting way to sort of grow your business. I was kind of, uh, uh, you know, being a strategy person. I was very really interested, you know, was uh, fascinated by that. But again, I think, um, you know, before we turn, open it up to the audience, um, you know, maybe, uh, let's see, you know, 
Um, one, one uh, perhaps last question on, you know, you, you, I know the Star Tribune has written a, a you know, it was a very complimentary piece on how you kind of have been communicating as a CFO and what you've been doing since. So do you have any comments on that? Is there anything that you'd like to share with us on how Fastenal has been communicating with its investors? Um, first off, if you always tell the truth, you don't need to have a very good memory. Because you, you never have to remember what you told somebody, because you told them the truth. The other thing is, too many people in life make things complicated. Sometimes things in life are pretty darn simple. So if you think about it, we go out and we source inventory. We find great people. We source inventory, and we have that available for our customers to use. And our cash-to-cash -cash cycle is relatively short from the time you buy the inventory till the time you get paid by your customer, less than a year. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you th if you think about the business like you would your own checkbook, you can communicate that thought process to your employees, but you can also communicate that thought process to your customers. That's what we've always done. I, I, I grew up on a family farm and uh, and later in, uh, in my, uh, when I was 30 years old, I, I met my, my wife-to-be, and, and her uh, family were, were in an independent business as well. And, and I always thought, you know, when, I, when I'm writing the annual report, when I'm, when I'm writing elements of our story to our shareholders, I'm writing a letter to my, my parents. I'm writing a letter to my in-laws. Hey, here's the, here's the business I'm with. And, and if you do that, I think, I think you, de, you simplify the business. It's not that they need it simple, but they don't have, they didn't spend 10 years at KPMG. They don't, they, they don't need me to use words that are foreign to everybody. Let's, let's use words that make sense. And that's how we approach it. And, but if we see something going on in the numbers, right. we tell you about it, because that's what, we think it's good for everybody to hear. To know why. No, I think this, it's wonderful, There's that simplicity of communication and the, Clarity is just uh, something that we could all learn from. So with that, I'd open it up to the audience for questions. There are folks both here and online, and we'll, there's some people with mics going around. Yes, so, we have yes. our first question here with Mark. Hi, and I really appreciate this presentation today. It's everything I believe in, and you're one of our vendors in our company, so thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, secondly, and most importantly, is that when Kelly Dorn was here from Dorn Construction quite a few months back, I had asked him a question about he was moving the business, some of it, not all of it, from Minnesota to Arizona and trying a new market. And I told him there's a great risk in that, and he agreed. How is your process as far as moving to the different storefronts, if you will, for Fastenal? How is that uh, processed? It's, uh, you, you do it enough. Um, sometimes trial and error, you figure stuff out. But, uh, you, you know, we manage it locally. When we talk about being decentralized, we mean that wholeheartedly. Our decisions that we make, if I'm out in the middle of Montana, the decision we made is, is not, we, we make is not made in Winona. It's made in the middle of Montana because that's where we're interacting with the customer. Uh, when, you, when you enter new states or new jurisdictions, you run into some surprises along the way. I, I would, I, right now we're investigating um, opening up in India. And there's things we have to learn in that market that are very different from what we've experienced in other 25 countries. It's a great opportunity, it's worthwhile to learn it, but it can, be, it can be struggling at times. I remember when we first opened in Mexico, that was our first entry into, that was our second foreign country. And if anybody here is from Canada, this is meant as a compliment. <laughs> but going into Canada for us, especially since we weren't in Quebec, the, it, it wasn't that, it was kind of like going into another state in the U.S. Because the language is the same, the business norms are the same, even product preferences are the same. If, if brand A is prevalent in Minnesota, it's probably prevalent up in Manitoba. And, uh, and, but we learned a lot. But it, but it took a little bit more work and took a lot more patience and you break a few things along the way. Great. All right, we have a question from our online audience. Yes, a viewer is wondering how has Amazon affected your business model? Great question. 
Um, over the years, uh, I've heard that question from uh, shareholders a few times. If I go back when I joined Fastenal back in the mid-90s, the question was usually about how was Home Depot going to put us out of business. And what I'm pleased to say is we're a supply chain partner. Most of our, most of our business is B2B, not B2C. So we don't really compete with um, an Amazon. In fact, Amazon is a customer of ours. So is Home Depot for that matter. So if you go to one of their fulfillment, to a distribution center, you will see Fastenal vending machines. There's not a picture that flies around Fastenal quicker. <laughs> I can't say Fastenal faster because that sounds funny. But quicker than um, a, a customer, I, I've, I've seen it many times, it's a, it's, it's a hand. And it was, an it, it was an article about Amazon, and they had a, they have a stock photo, and it was a picture of one of their facilities. There's a hand grab in the box. That, that, that went around fast and really fast because the glove that hand was wearing was a Fastenal brand. <laughs> and, and so we've learned to, to, to serve a market in a whole new way. In fact, when I think back to when COVID started, that was a scary time for everybody. And uh, I, was, I was traveling out of town and, and uh, I, was, I was on vacation that, um, in, in, uh, in March. But every day I'm, I'm talking with our team, Brooke Millsno, who, who's our vice president of marketing, she was probably getting tired of me because a lot of it was understanding how we should communicate. And, and I remember uh, uh, us working through a message that we sent out to, I think, 450,000 customers on a weekend that said, on Monday when you come in to work, if you stop to visit us, the, door, the front door is locked. We are open for business. Call, call us ahead of time. We'll have product ready for you. But... Close to 90% of what we do doesn't go out the front door at Fastenal. It goes out the back door. And it's coming to a vending machine at the U of M campus. It's coming to one of our customers across 25 countries. And our, we knew our customers were going to be locking down their facilities. If we didn't do the same, we're the weak link in their business. And so we closed our front door, but we stayed open for business. And you, we adapted really fast. I remember it was, a, it was a week or two later. It was, it was a week later. It was on the weekend. It was, it was the one time in seven years I couldn't sleep as the CEO of Fastenal. And the, the reason I couldn't, um, our leaders, Bill Draskowski is one of them who was wearing me out, Casey Miller, Jeff Watts, they were hearing from their team about the anxiety that people had. And they were worried about getting sick or a family member getting sick or a relative, a parent getting sick. I guess that's a family member too, sorry about that. But uh, I'm sitting there, when I'm uncomfortable, sometimes I revert to math. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, if we offered two weeks of additional time off, above and beyond what we do right now, here's what it could cost. That scared the bejesus out of me. I don't know if I can say that word publicly, but that, that scared me. And I got in on Monday, and I sat down with our head of HR, and I said, Renee, we're going to extend two weeks of time off, paid time off, to our employees, full-time and part-time. Part-time employees don't always get the same benefits. COVID doesn't care if you're full-time or part-time. Mm -hmm. You're going to get COVID. You're going to get it. We're going to extend the same benefit to everybody, and we're going to announce it. Brooke and I are going to announce it uh, after work tomorrow on Tuesday. So you have 24 hours to figure out how we're going to do it. And to her credit, she did, and we rolled it out. But that was a, that was a scary time, because you, you were trying to figure out what do you need. And, and for me, the, the best way to keep sanity was I started doing a video every Friday that went to 22,000 fast employees. I don't know how many watched it any given week. Maybe it was just therapy for Dan. <laughs> but I would tell them exactly what was happening within Fastenal. You know, today, depending on what channel you put on, you could learn about the same occurrence and the story is completely different on two different channels. That's not how Fastenal operates and that's not how Dan was gonna operate. So every month, our employees knew how many people in Fastenal had, had, had been diagnosed with COVID. What we were doing to make our environment safer. Because 94% of our employees can't work remotely. If, if, you, if you work in a manufacturing facility supporting your customer, you have to go to work. You can't, you, can't, you can't be at home. Now, for the six or seven that could, we said to everybody right away, we went out and spent four years worth of CapEx on computer equipment, 
get out of here so it's safe for the other 94 that have to be here. And, and it wasn't one group was getting treated better. It's like the rest of the folks don't want you around if you don't have to be here. But you figured out what you needed to do to calm the anxiety in the room. I wish, I wish society would have done that more, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's it. Very, just very, very inspiring, Dan. And, and other questions? Somebody there? Okay, yes. Yeah, this is KK Sinha. I'm in the Supply Chain Operations Department at the Carlson School. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, your perspective, information. From where I sit, you know, it seems like you are one of those people and your company is one of those who have had the, what I call the front row seat in terms of because you're supply chain partners of just about every other company that you work with. So as you look into the future um, and what guidance can you provide to us as an institution as we are preparing the next generation of supply chain professionals and leaders? Uh, because you have that wisdom, you have that visibility. The, uh, um, one of the slides I shared was what we call our digital footprint and how we're moving some of our business um, into more um, technology-enabled supply chain. We do that because we're a firm believer for our business to our customers. 65% of what, what happens is repetitive, but we don't know it. My guess is most of the things you do in your life are pretty repetitive if you, if you took a step back. And, and for us, it's understanding that 65% and, and, and giving our customer better visibility to what they're, what they're using so we can have conversations with our customer about optionality. If you know what you're gonna need three and six months from now, you can give it, the stuff you buy today, most of it is you, you, you could have known months ago. If, with that visibility, we can say to our customer, here's some optionality. Here's brand A, here's brand B. Here's pros and cons. We've had discussions with our customers where we'll say, we had a customer a few years ago that I highlighted at a, at a customer event where we saved them $115,000 a year in one glove. We told them to buy a more expensive glove. Looking at your business, what you're doing, the glove is wearing out too fast. We have, we have 30,000 other customers that use this glove, and here's, and, and here's what they use it for. You're doing something fundamentally different, and we know that because we have people in your facility. You buy a more expensive glove, it'll last longer, and you'll save money. We saved them $115,000 in, in one part. Part of it is you can't impress upon students enough to be comfortable using data, to be comfortable using math, mm -hmm. and, and be able to spot trends. If you can spot trends, oof, you can do some amazing things in supply chain. And then you, uh, and, uh, and then you obsess every day about how do you bring that, that knowledge, that empowerment to more and more people. We're great. If you look at this table right here in the middle, second table back, this is not anything against the first table, but the second table back is a bunch of Fastenal folks. Yeah. We're great because of them and what they've learned and what they're comfortable sharing with their customer. And sometimes that means being uncomfortable. Sometimes that means get down ahead of your skis a little bit. But they have the benefit of they're surrounded by a bunch of great people and they can bounce it off each other before they talk to a customer. But preparing people for that, um, we partner with schools that value um, understanding logistics, understand supply chain, understand challenging people on how you think about stuff. Because that's more valuable to our customer. Our customer, what we sell, our customer can get anywhere. There's nothing magical about our shelf other than the folks that are taking care of that shelf and taking care of yours. And, and, and uh, we actively also go after the, that kid that's in school because we know that some are gonna decide they're gonna do something different, but if they're great at supply chain or, or whatever they do, and part of that greatness came from us, we're better off as a business and we're better off as a society. 
Sorry to take us off on that, that tangent there. Hi, uh, my name is Maxine. I work with the Carlson Global Institute in the um, Carlson School. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that you are working on increasing your percentage of women and minorities in the workplace, and I just wanted to know um, what steps, if any, are you taking towards um, getting more women and minorities in your workplace? Sure. The, uh, you know, one of the things that, that uh, when I look at our trends over the last, on that, and I'm talking about the right-hand column, because where we are geographically changes from the standpoint of the racial mix. Where we are geographically doesn't change of the gender mix. And, uh, and, and one of the, some of the simple things with technology is you're much more thoughtful about how you communicate and where you communicate. We're more thoughtful about where we post job openings Sometimes, if, if, you have a, if you have a group of people that you know that, uh, that is your recruiting pool, that's a good recruiting pool, don't get me wrong. But maybe your recruiting pool should include people you don't know as well. And, and, you, and you consciously figure out, I'm going to post it to this site or that site because we're going to get a bunch of folks we're not getting. You also mm -hmm. make sure when you're partnering with universities, what are they doing? Do 100% do of their employees look like me? Or do they have a good mix? Because a lot of what influences our ability to recruit a more diverse pool is that if I'm in northern Minnesota, if I'm in western South Dakota, am I in southern Cal, wherever it is, are the places I'm doing outreach to going to produce a bunch of clones of Dan, or are they going to provide a bunch of really talented people and, 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 and we talk about it inside the organization. We, we, we share that, that slide um, on a routine basis. I have uh, uh, general managers and what we call BOMs, business operations managers at our local sites, in for training. And every week, I'll have a slide of that. And we, and we talk about it, even if it makes some folks uncomfortable, including Dan. And then you make sure that when you're thinking about opportunities, you're challenging everybody for the opportunities. Sometimes we all, our bias can be, well, this opportunity might not be right for this person or that person because of this or that reason. That's BS. Challenge everybody, and if somebody chooses that's not the opportunity for them right now, so be it. I was traveling in Indiana a few years ago, and there was a, I was visiting a really interesting um, company, and uh, they, they convert vehicles to be handicap accessible, and we're on site with them. And as I'm getting a tour of the facility, I, I, I try to meet all the, fa all, the, all the blue shirts when I'm walking around the facility, all the fast home employees. And, uh, and there's a young lady that I'm chatting with, and afterwards, and I probably have this story wrong because it's been probably five, six years. Um, and, uh, but after we left, I'm talking to the district manager about this young lady that, that works at the on-site. And I said, hey, what's her story? He said, oh, well, she works for us part-time. And she used to work in the branch. She wanted to work part-time because she just, she works in the mornings. I said, what's your training plan for her? And he didn't have a great answer. And I kind of gave him a dirty look in, in, a, in a friendly way. <laughs> but, but, but I said, you know, you know why she works part-time? She has a five-year-old and a three-year-old at home. And her husband works at a, a dairy operation near here that has a thousand cows. And he works weird hours. And she needed to know that I, I can go into work at 8.30 and I can leave at 12.30. And in the branch, she couldn't always do that, but in the onsite, she could. That's why she's working in the onsite. I can, I'm not good with numbers, but I can tell you in five and 10 years, she won't have a five and a three-year-old. You know, heck, in 10 years, she might have a 15 and a 13-year-old. <laughs> Just going on a limb here. And, and if you're investing, if you're challenging her to do training right now, mm -hmm. in five years and 10 years, her priorities might change. And she's ready for that role. Worst case scenario, she doesn't want that role, and, she, and she's a great employee, and she knows that you really care about her. She'll run through a wall for you, because you care. Another scenario might be, you sign a bunch more on-sites in this market, 
and she comes to you in five years and says, you know, I've been, I've been doing a little math, and I've, I've learned a bunch at the School of Business. I've told my husband, we're gonna switch roles because I can make more running, money running an onsite than he can milking cows. <laughs> and you've created an opportunity for her. But if you just think of her as a part-time employee that's gonna work four hours a day, you wasted an opportunity, shame on you. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know what she's doing today. And I, I hope whatever she's doing, she loves. And, uh, but that's the mindset you need to have with everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, challenge everybody to grow. And, and they will choose what, what their outcome is. Don't choose it for them. Right. You keep doing that, people notice it. And people wanna work for organizations like that. Regardless of what you look like. That is wonderful advice, Dan, even for any educational institution because with every student who comes through the door, that's what we hope to achieve. That is, let them, you know, challenge them to grow and but let them make those decisions for themselves about how it is they want to grow and what it is they want to do. So that's, uh, and that's how we transform lives. So thank you for that. I think we're out of time. Can so I add one? Sure. So our, our, our youngest, our daughter turned 18 last Friday. Mm -hmm. Society needs to give her a great opportunity. That's what you look out for as a parent. Mm -hmm. the, right. Our three older boys, Sylvia, you know, society's already figured out how to give them an opportunity. Right. Anna needs one too. Right. Well, thank you, Dan. That was uh, wonderfully inspiring and something that we should all kind of carry. I'm sure we'll have lots of things to carry away from this conversation with you. And uh, thank you all for being here. And next month uh, in June, it'll be the, my last first Tuesday as Dean. And we have uh, Lily Hall of Knock, who's going to be here. So I hope many of you are able to come back for it. Anyway, go out and enjoy this wonderful spring day, even if it's still a bit chilly. I don't know if it's, <laughs> but we'll take it. This is spring for us. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.